Coach Greg, and today I'm going to be telling you why you should not train like Jeff Nippert. I like Jeff and I like his content and I agree with 90 to 95 percent of what he says which is a lot. We can't all agree on doing exactly the same thing all the time so I disagree with some things. He is now training his entire body so like chest, shoulders, five times in one seven day period. So that's almost every single day. So essentially you're doing biceps five days in a row type thing. I actually train full body five days a week. I typically have one, I think one to two leg movements a day and then three to four upper body movements a day, five sure. days a week. It's really interesting. I've never trained with quite exactly that style, yeah. but I'm going to after this. In this case, it's simply not optimal. And I'm gonna tell you at the end of the video, my recommendations, what you should be doing so you have some take home advice. In case you don't know, Jeff Nippert is a science-based presenter on YouTube. So it's essentially research-based or evidence-based. He'll quote 10 different research studies and say, I read this here and this here, and so you should train this way or eat this way, and it's not bro science. For every study you find that says something, you can probably find a study to find the opposite. And if you don't know how to read between the lines, you can often come to the wrong conclusions, or you can extrapolate and, and basically decide something that isn't really true. Back in the old days, people thought, one one body part a week so you train legs once a week chest once a week shoulders once a week more and more research has said well is this really the case should i be doing this and they started saying well no and they did research to prove this and then it came to the conclusion two to three times a week is where they felt it was optimal but there's no conclusive evidence to point to say Twice a week is better than three. Three is better than two. Five is better than six. Seven is better. Twice a day is better. They don't really know for sure. That's where years of training experience, coaching, training clients, and just experimentation comes into account where you just can't say, well, this science says this and do this. You might not know this, but I started training at 10. I'm 43. So that's I've, I've trained for 33 years. There's a lot. When I first started, I trained each body part three times a week and I did one hard set per body part. That's it. I was a beginner though, and it worked well, but I mean, I was 10. Anything would have worked well. I also did it all wrong because I was training with sets of six. Didn't know, just following a Joe Weider program back in the day, training with my twin brother, my dad. I did the once a week, I did the six, every six days, every five days, every four days, every three. That's where I'm at right now. I'm on a three-day split. So I train my whole body every three days. I used to do it every seven. And I found, I was like, well, I'm recovered. Why am I waiting? And so I was missing opportunities for growth. And later the signs came out to say, yeah, you're right. You should be training more often. So two to three times a week is more optimal. When you train the same body part more than three times in a week, you're forced to do at least one of those workouts on consecutive days. So if you do four workouts, four, say chest four times a week, at least one of those workouts is chest back to back. So this is where I just think it's ridiculous. I don't think you should train the same body part two days in a row intensely. I mean, it depends on how hard you're pushing yourself and how sore you are, but optimally, it makes more sense to train, say, every other day, at least, to so give your body a chance to recover and repair. So Jeff Nippard and Eric Holmes, they basically are in favor of volume as being the be-all, end-all, most important variable for muscle growth. Now, if you train all out, you can't handle a lot of volume. You can't do 100 sets of squats to failure in a week. It just you just you can't recover. So they're they're lowering their intensity to let you go harder. I don't really agree with that. I think that they should be more focused on the time under tension and the intensity and not just basically volume. So let's dig into this a bit more. Let's like, well, what is volume? Because that's what they're in. They're all about volume. So sets times the reps times the weight. So let's say you got 10 sets with 10 reps and 100 pounds. That's going to be like 10 sets of 10 with 100 pounds, that's 10,000 pounds. So your volume of your workout was you did 10,000 pounds. That could be a lot of volume or a little bit of volume. Let's take option B and say, okay, it's all about volume. So you lifted 10,000 pounds. I go in and I do no sets. I just flex as hard as I can. Maybe the body's not moving. So I'm just, that's an isometric contraction because there's no 
lengthening or shortening of the muscle. So there's no eccentric lengthening or concentric when the muscle's contracting and shortening. Does that mean I didn't train? Of course not. I could try to deadlift a thousand pounds off the ground and it sits there and I do a hundred sets of zedal. No movement. Do you think I didn't get sore? I might not be able to move the next day. It may be way more sore than the guy who did a hundred reps with a hundred pounds, but I did no volume. So, so you can see how that kind of messes things up there. So you can't just say, oh, this is the volume. And then when you further look at volume, well, how far did the bar go? What if I did partial reps? You did all the way down and all the way up and I only went here. Well, then that's the distance. So then we have to measure how much weight you lifted times how much um, distance it traveled. Then, well, what about the time it takes to do this? Because if I do 10 sets or 10 reps and it takes me 10 seconds and the other guy goes really slow and controls the weight and does it over a minute, then that minute is a lot more work. It's a lot harder to do, even though you didn't lift more volume. So you can't just say, oh, this versus this versus this. Now, what about the intensity? Now, this is an interesting, because how do we define how hard did you work? Did you train hard? Yeah, I killed it in the gym today. I killed it. I killed my workout. You hear it all the time. What does killed your workout mean? Well, to some people, it means you went and did a half-ass set and just worked out. To me, it means you went all out. You went beyond failure on many sets and you left the gym feeling like there's no way I could do more. And if I did, it would just ruin me because that's just a mess. To some people, it's RP this, RP that, this intensity, this many reps, a volume of five sets of five, only rested a minute between sets. What does that all mean? In general form, this is what people say. RP, you might not have heard of this term. RP, okay, so how close your reps are to how many you could get for a thousand dollars or a gun to your head. If I said deadlift this weight, it's 225 pounds, go till you can't go. You do 10 reps. And I have the gun, I'm like, you better do one more or I shoot you dead. You try, you get it halfway up and you can't and I shoot you and you're dead. You went all out. You did 10 reps to me, plus a half, so you did an RP of 10.5. It's more than 10. 10 is the limit, but you went harder because I was gonna kill you. They're saying, Jeff and Eric Holmes, to train, and they were doing this in their video, an RP of eight to 10. And so they were doing three sets of each body part, RP of eight to 10. Okay. Here's the problem. How do you know how many reps you could actually get? So Jeff, for example, is doing the leg press and, he, and he's supposed to go eight to 10 and Eric does it first and he goes and he's like, oh, it looks like a nine or a nine and a half or a 10. He's training hard and he's like six days out from a show, shredded and he's doing it really hard, which is hard a six days out. Jeff goes in, does a set, Eric says, so what kind of RP was that? And he's like eight and then he looks at him, he's like, maybe 7.5. I'm looking at him like, that's a six at most. That ain't hard, that's a warm-up set. So he did a warm-up set, but that counts as one of his sets. The other guy does a set of 10. The difference between an RP of eight and 10 is astounding. It is mind-blowing. If you're doing all sets of eight, when you could do 10, you're leaving two reps in the tank. That's what that means. If you're doing an RP of three, you're leaving seven reps in the tank. If you're training to eight, to me, that's a warm-up. You just warmed up. That's not hard. Uh, I could do eight all day. If I can do 10, I could do a million sets of eight and just keep going. It's like half-ass training. My training, when I train, I start counting after I get to 10, like after it's all out. Then it's like, how many half reps can I get? How many parcels? How long can I control the eccentric before it goes down? So most of my sets, when I'm calling them working sets, are beyond failure. Okay. Now, of course, if you're a beginner, that's not where you want to train. And you have to remember progressive overload. You have to start easy and go hard. So you don't start with a new program. Say I design you a program and it's, and it says go hard and day one, you're bench press to failure and you're deadlifting all that. No, you start and you hold back because the new program, you need to get used to it over each week. You build up the intensity. So you're working out harder and harder and harder. That's progressive overload. The muscle needs a greater stimulus. It could be greater intensity. It could be greater volume. It could be greater anything, more work, more horsepower, a slowed time under tension or decreased rest between sets, whole number of ways to increase the actual intensity and workout that you're doing. So what I usually say is to just do the same amount of volume, but to go harder towards that end zone. 
So maybe you start on day one and you're, and you're doing RPE, if you're a beginner, five. But once you've trained harder and you're more used to it, it has to be approaching that failure or beyond failure. So if you, if you had to do a set of 12 reps and you got 11 and you could have done 12, then you didn't go hard enough. That could be at the level you're at. Depends on where you are in your training. So Jeff's training is basically for beginners, okay? Jeff overall doesn't train that hard. I just, I've watched many of his sets and it's not hard. I can prove Jeff trains like a pussy most of the time. I'm sorry, but that's the friggin' truth of the matter. I put 405 pounds on the bar and figured out what I could do in terms of max reps with that. And I got six reps, but if I look, if you look at the footage and I'll have it up here, you can see that I probably could have gotten at least two more. Um, so that was the question that this study was looking at. They were looking at what they thought their max reps would be with a set specific load. And on average, the subjects underestimated how many reps they'd get by three to four reps. So what this study tells us basically is that people, especially beginners, are bad at gauging their RPE. I watched it and it looked like a warm up. He could have done 10 reps for sure. When I do a set of five and it's hard, it's friggin' hard. When I do a set of 15, my fifth rep looks harder than his fifth rep. Like it just, it's not hard. He could have put 50 more pounds on the bar and done it again. So he's constantly training easy, not training hard. And it's good for beginners, but it's just not hard enough. It's been like that in every sport. I, bike riding. I go for a bike ride and they're like, yeah, go in zone two, heart rate, whatever. I'm like, okay, well, I'm just gonna ride easy. And I come back and I look, I'm like, okay, how hard did I go? I'm in zone four. Now apparently that's like super hard training. I'm like, well, I wasn't dying. So I felt like it was easy, even though it was hard. It wasn't crazy hard. So I'm so used to going balls out crazy hard that to me, I don't understand training like half ass. So most people train half ass. Most people train like pussies, which is fine if you're a beginner. But if you want to be a professional bodybuilder or an elite level Olympic athlete, you can't train half ass all the time. You can start that way. And people with superior genetics, they kicked my ass all the time. When I was on the swim team in high school, I would swim in practice and I would beat these guys every single day, swimming, the laps. Then we'd go to a race and they would beat me by five seconds. I'm like, how in the world did you beat me? Like, I beat you every time in practice. They're like, well, in practice, I never train hard. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, like when they say that I just don't go hard. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I didn't get it. Like, I always went all out. That's just how I did it. So. I just am blown away by the half-assed nature of most people who work out. So some things to address because people are just gonna bring this up in the comments right away. Oh, but the science says this. The research uses average folks. They don't use professional bodybuilders or Olympic champion, world champion. I've never been in this study. I, they haven't trained me to see what works best. So how can you just automatically conclude that if it says that this many reps and this intensity works, well, it works at an RP of eight if you get a bunch of amateur losers who haven't even trained hard before and they do a bunch of sets of eight because they're only here on their training. But what if they're already here? When I did a, uh, I did a study in, a, in, in kinesiology in university and they, they tested me and they made me train a certain way and I got weaker and I was the only one that got weaker. And I was like, well, of course I got weaker. I'm already bench pressing 300 and something pounds. And if you lower my training intensity to what you want me to do, which was whatever bench press thing, it was under a tick tock, you had to rep at certain speed. I was the only one that got weaker. And I was like, of course, I, cause it was pussy training compared to what I was used to. Oh, but Greg, you're on steroids. Jeff is natural. And so it doesn't apply to Jeff. He, he can't train hard because he's natural and, and he has to train five times a week. I have more experience with natural training than almost anyone. So I can speak just because I'm not natural right this minute doesn't mean I don't know how to train natural. Steroids, if anything, make you recover faster. If I recover faster, does it not make sense that I could train more often the same body part? So if you're on steroids, technically, maybe you could get away with training the same body part five days a week versus being natural, you'd think you'd need more rest to recover. So don't say, oh, but he's natural, so he gets away with that. Does not make sense. Then you're gonna have people write, 
Oh, but Dorian Yates did one body part a week and trained this way, and it, and he looks better than you. Or my friend at the gym, he trains this way, and he looks better. So what? There's people with great genetics that train stupid and look better than people that train all proper. It doesn't mean anything to just say this and say, Ronnie Coleman trained this way, and he won this many titles. Yeah, maybe that's the best way. Maybe it's not. Dorian Yates trained this way. This guy did this way. This guy did 100. You can't just say this guy did this and mean anything. Even if you train all wrong, even if you do your sets wrong, even if your form is wrong, if your genetics are just superior, you're going to make gains anyway. Not optimal, but probably say 90%. So what we're trying to get here is marginal differences in training that leads to better growth. If all you do is train, it doesn't, you can train each body part every single day, seven days a week, or you could train once a week. You're still gonna make progress if you just join the gym and do this. You're gonna make great progress for a long time. If you just train, you eat, it doesn't even matter what you eat, you're gonna make great progress, but you're not gonna get to your genetic limit of awesomeness, of how good you could actually be. You might get to 90%, but the 10% is what's what we're talking about here. When you train super hard, and you can't, and it's partial reps, you need more rest than RP of eight. And if they say, oh, you need to do a train at an intensity of RP of eight to 10, that is night and day difference. So if your rest time is one to two minutes and your RP was 10, you might need to rest three minutes. If you're at eight, maybe you only needed to rest one minute to recover because it wasn't that hard. And everyone recovers at a different rate. Some people have more recovery than others. I need a shit ton long to recover. When I'm racing on my bicycle and I do one all out set hard, I pretty well beat anybody for one minute. I have one minute power over 800 watts. If you probably don't know what that means, but for one minute, like one kilometer in a sprint, I can go super fast. Then guess what? Ask me to do it again in two or three minutes. Everyone that I beat is beating me because I'm not recovered because I went balls to the wall all out and can't recover from that. I need 10 minutes and after 10 minutes, I still won't be able to go as fast. Other people, they go all out for a minute, they rest two minutes and do it again. They can do 10 sets. I cannot do that. I am good at a sprint, a short distance of power and, and right around 30 seconds to a minute is my strong point. I suck at going for three hours straight. I don't have recovery. So in the gym, in the weight room, people, it's the same thing. Some people can go and do a set and rest a minute and go again and do a minute and rest again, and they're fine. I can't, I need more rest. The harder you go, the longer you need to rest. So if you're not training as intensely, you don't need to rest as long. So if you're going at RP of eight, well, what does that mean? That means that you need to do more volume because you're not going hard. It means you don't need to rest long because you're not going hard. So you can do a lot of sets in a little bit of time. If you're like me and you do RP of 10 plus, so I'm doing 10 reps and I'm doing half for 10 more partials. That's like an RP of 15. I'm resting five minutes because I'm gone. I'm spent, I need five minutes to recover. I might only do 10 sets and the other guy does 20 or 25 sets. I had a harder workout even though I'm sitting there and texting on my phone the whole time. That's just how it is. Have a look. My form on a leg press. Is this a video? I'm leg pressing and this is like right after the show that I just did in Toronto. So my, I'm quite lean and whatnot. And I'm not, I'm not like fully recovered here. I'm, I hardly ate. You know, it's after the show. I'm dehydrated. And I'm still pushing myself harder than Jeff would as he's fresh and training and the guy says do an RP of eight to 10. And you can see is if when Jeff does his leg press, he slams his leg, like it, how do I explain it? He pushes and then knees are going like, Ugh. and I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm watching and I'm like cringing. Cause I'm like, his knees are gonna snap and he's gonna break his legs off. So I'm like, his form on the leg press is absolutely incorrect and dangerous. You never lock out your knee and slam it at the top. It, it'd be like bench pressing and locking it and snap and then, oh, and it's just, I'm cringing as I'm watching his leg press form. So don't train like that. Don't snap it at the top. Try to keep constant tension on the muscle. So, you know, you're working here and you're still working here. You're not locking it out and resting. So when you're leg pressing, don't snap and hyperextend the knee at the top. That's just not good training practice. So if you compare my form to his, you can clearly see I'm training harder than he is and I'm dehydrated in a mess from doing a show and he's fresh as a daisy. And don't tell me, 
Oh, but it's because you're on steroids. <laughs> Stop it. Stop making excuses and train hard. You don't think I trained hard when I was 10 or 12 or 15 when I didn't even know what a steroid was? Steroids give you some more aggression, but doesn't just make you train hard over and over all the, all the time. And I did 42 shows natural and I trained hard and built muscle. And if Jeff trained harder, he would get bigger and he would be better than he is right now. And he is natural. And so, so many comments, and there's no way he's natural. Oh my God, you guys, you have no idea what you can achieve naturally. Because why? Because most people start taking steroids the second they build a tiny bit of muscle. They train for two years and it's like, oh, I'm at my natural limit now because I didn't put on five pounds of muscle this month. It's like, you're not at a limit. You, you can gain three or four pounds of muscle each year. It's going to keep happening for many, many, many years. But people jump the gun and take steroids way too young, way too early, 95%. So that's why every time somebody sees a bill that has muscle, they assume they're on steroids because 95% of the time they actually are because they can't resist the urge. So when you see a 23-year-old with all this muscle, well, they probably are on steroids because they, they didn't want to wait. They could have gained muscle and trained till they were 30 natural, then took it or trained till they were 40 or whatever. But so just don't assume it and don't really don't care about it. The fact is, yeah, most people that look like they're on steroids are on steroids. If you're going to bet, then they probably are. Doesn't mean there's not exceptions. Oh, man, I have to pee. Oh, man. Okay, so in conclusion, what do you do? All right, here's the tips for you. Take home message right now. Train each body part two to three times a week. Two to three, not five, not like Jeff's five. That's way too many times. When I ask clients, how often do you train and I design a plan, I take into account what are they used to and how much rest do they usually get and then I design it accordingly. If they're used to resting 30 seconds between sets, I'm not gonna tell them to rest four minutes between sets. Next is the volume. So each body part should be worked 15 to 30 sets per week for an intermediate to advanced person. If you're a beginner, forget it. You just go through the motions and learn. If you've never joined the gym, you just take Take yourself through the motions and learn how to do it with proper form. Well, how do you know if it's 15 to 30? Well, here's the thing. You don't know without, no, without trying. So for example, for me, my hamstrings cannot handle 15 sets per week. My shoulders can handle sets all day, it seems. They don't tire out. I don't really feel sore. My chest can handle maybe 15 sets. It just, it gets sore more quickly and, and it's just like, it just doesn't want that. So depending on your body part, 15 to 30 sets. Now 30 sets, if you're training like more easy, like half ass, you're probably gonna be able to handle 30 sets. If you're going balls to the wall, drop sets, maybe 15. Overall, Jeff Nippard's training, I'm telling you, do not follow it. Unless perhaps you're a beginner and you're not going hard and you're training half ass and you wanna do that and it's for fun. But I would strongly suggest to just train each body part at most three times a week. And if you're like, well, I wanna do my whole body each time, and it's like, okay, three times a week, go do your whole body. The other days, you, you still wanna to go to the gym. Go do some cardio, work the heart, get in shape somewhere else. Do some flexibility, some stretching and all that stuff, some foam rolling. Don't just say, well, I gotta train. There's other things you can do. Cardio is good for your fitness. If you get more in shape with your cardio, you're gonna be able to recover faster from your workouts as well. It's all around fitness that you need to be going for. It's not like a bash Jeff Nippard video. It's just a don't do what he's doing in this case because most of the time his information is great and he's backing it up with science, which is great, but it's not just science, it's practical too, guys. And remember, scientific studies, they're not always perfect. Just because it said it did this in this study doesn't mean it will do it to you. You might be a different exception to that because you know, if let's say they took natural athletes and did something and then they took enhanced athletes and they said, well, we gave them this supplement, didn't do anything for the enhanced athletes. Well, doesn't mean it won't for the natural athletes. If you want to see more videos, maybe you want to see if Jeff Nippard's natty or not. I did a video on that. Or top 10 training principles for maximizing muscle. That's a good video to check out if you want to know more about how to build muscle. GregDuset.com, that is my website for coaching. Follow me on Instagram, Greg Duset, IFBB Pro. Post lots of current updated pics and so on. And so if you're into following that, then be sure to follow.